Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we are doing a birthday special. So it is the Ram's birthday and uh, I recently decided to go up in the attic and pull down every box that I could find that seemed kind of vintage or interesting. Um, I left some of the more generic, you know, widely seen boxes and I figured this would be a fun video just to kind of lay back and just have a conversation about perfume. Pr pretty much my favorite thing to do with this channel. Um, and so what I did is I gathered up a couple boxes and I may have kind of shot myself in the foot a little bit because I spent hours actually moving bottles and stuff into the boxes and behind the sliding doors. And I realized after I was done that even though I kind of thought a little bit about the sun while I did it, because I was thinking, you know what, they're going to be in the boxes. So even when the doors are shut and there's boxes on the sides here, uh, it's fine because they're in the boxes, but what I didn't realize is then going to find a bottle, I can't just reach back and grab it like I've been doing, especially if it's like this, in the boxes. So, uh, this may be a temporary thing. I may end up just taking them out and putting all the bottles back, uh, because it's kind of, it's kind of a pain to reach back and slide open the door and it can be kind of loud and my daughter's room is downstairs, all, all kind of stuff, right? Um... And so basically what I did is I figured it would just be cool to talk about these before they end up going back into the attic because some people were asking me, hey man, can you show us some of the boxes uh, so we know which ones to look for, older versions, this, that, or whatever. So I said, okay, this will be a fun video to have, I think, uh, where we can just kind of kick back and talk about some perfume. So what I did is I just pulled some uh, vintage boxes out that don't have not, you know, rarely get any limelight on the channel. And so we're just going to kind of go through them. But first, uh, I do want to do the customary scent of the day. And today, the scent of the day that I wore is this little bad boy. One of my favorite fragrances of all time, by the way. Um, and it is Ottoman Empire by Arige Ladore, the original Ottoman Empire. It is, oh man, it is out of this world good. There's like five different types of rose in here. Um, there's also a Rose Otto, I believe. Uh, sorry, that's not correct. There is a, um, according to the Aris Ladore website, there is, um, Bulgarian Rose. There is, um, Indian Rose Absolute, Thai White Rose, and Pure Rose Oil from Afghanistan. Not not a Rosado, pure rose oil from Afghanistan, Jamaican pepper, cardamom, jasmine, frangipani water, freshly co-distilled by Russian Adam, and uh, frangipani flowers, saffron, attar, aged over 20 years, three types of oud, which is just the oud in here is amazing. Oh, it's so, it's so, so good. Uh, there's also some spices and this unbelievable sandalwood base with vintage oak moss, it just smells divine. One of my favorite fragrances of all time. I'm still hunting a full bottle, but they are very hard to come by and they're extremely expensive. Um, and so it's on my wish list. But in the meantime, I will continue to nurse this beautiful little decant. Okay, so that was my scent of the day, Ottoman Empire. I've been craving real ouds lately. I've been on a little bit of an oud kick. All right, so let's talk about some of these. Um, so the first one that I pulled out is a fragrance from Jacques Bogart. One of the few Jacques Bogart that actually got discontinued. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and shut this while we're talking about these, and then we'll open it back up. I think I am going to end up taking all the bottles out and putting them, just putting the boxes back upstairs. It was a cool thought, but in implementation, I think it's going to be a little bit of a hassle. Um, so this is Witness by the house of Jacques Bogart. And Witness is, here's the back for the people asking the sides and the back of the box. And you can kind of see the shorter ingredient list. This actually came from the Great Anuj, but I had a 30 mil um, that I don't know where I got it from, but I don't think it had a box with it. So this is technically my backup. So this is the 30 mil uh, that I have a little small dent in. Mm. So Witness is basically this spicy early 90s type DNA. Um, and I've said this before, but the cinnamon in Witness reminds me a little bit of the cinnamon in Balenciaga Por Homme and the cinnamon in Romeo Jiggly Per Uomo. There just seems to be this weird connection between early 90s 
uh, the way that cinnamon was used in the early 90s. Oh, it's so good though. There's this uh, very green touch and in here it's mugwort. And so the mugwort adds this 80s vibe. So even though it's a 90s fragrance, it still feels like you're in the 80s with, um, with Witness, which there were a bunch of fragrances from the early 90s that still felt that way. Um, and, you know, specifically you think about things like uh, Escada Por Homme, uh, or Joint by Rocco Barocco. Uh, that is just amazing, fantastic. Eight. That, that deserves to be in the 80s Hall of Fame, even though it's a 90s fragrance. Um, and so you can see the, the 50 mil actually has the built-in sprayer. The 30 mil doesn't. Very similar to the way Balenciaga Por Homme did theirs. The 30 mil of my Balenciaga Por Homme does not have the built-in sprayer, sprayer. The 50 and the 100 mil does. Uh, and I actually like these presentations. I think uh, Jacques Bogart does amazing presentations for the value for money from this house is through the roof, right? So this is orange lemon mugwort, cinnamon geranium rose, patchouli sandalwood styrax, and benzoin. And so it's spicy, it's woody, it's uh, slightly resinous because of that kind of styrax benzoin thing. And I'm uh, I'm a big fan. I love this stuff. I think it's fantastic. I think if you're a fan of uh, Balenciaga Por Homme, if you're a fan of Romeo Jiggly Per Womo, if you're a fan of uh, Futuros by um, the House of Abassin or Abassin Ho'om, these are all kind of fragrances that I would say you could lump together into this uh, late 80s, early you know 90s category. And uh, Witnesses is good juice. Very few people talk about Witness anymore. Uh, I don't think it's one of these vintage fragrances that really went crazy and the price skyrocketed or anything like that. But um, but yes, it's uh, it's one that I think you can still find at a respectable price if you look around, just because it doesn't get hype. Very few people hype these type of fragrances, you know. It's not on the YouTube hype train, so you can still find a pretty good deal if you if you look. Okay, so that is Witness by Jacques Bogart. Number two, and this is not ranked or anything. These are just showing off some boxes, bottles and boxes. Um, number two is going to be Rockford. So Rockford is a fragrance from Atkinson's, and um, it's a fragrance that I like, but uh, it's not my favorite from the house. You'll, you'll, I'm going to show you one coming up very soon that is my favorite from the house, but this is basically this uh, spicy, and what I think is um, sort of, uh, how could you describe this one? If you've ever smelled a fragrance from Hugo Boss called Boss Elements, this came out in 1985. Boss Elements came out in the early 90s. So actually, Rockford came out first. But there's a little bit of this. Um, some people think this smells leathery. Some people think Boss Elements smells leathery. Uh, if there is leather touches, it is very subtle. And you guys know me, that's not how I like my leather. I actually like my leather bold and in your face. Think of things like Bellamy, right, by Hermes, or Leonard Porhom, or something like that. Um, and so this is really, for me, more about things like the lavender, which is very posh in this, I must admit. Um, lavender, there's a little bit of basil. It's slightly green, but it almost feels like uh, there's this fresh vetiver in this fragrance as well. Um, along with cyclamen, mace, carnation, sandalwood, uh, amber, oak moss, musk, and tonka bean. It's very classy. Uh, I would say this is a fragrance that can be worn, you know, to important meetings or something like that at work. It's a, it's a very respectful fragrance. They re-released this in the year 2000, and it looks completely different. Uh, I see bottles of this going for silly money. I also hear people kind of hyping this. Um, just, I think because it's a little rarer to find, uh, when you do find a bottle, bottles can be very expensive. I don't think it's worth what it's, this is, this is not one of the vintage fragrances that I would say, go spend huge money on. You know, is it elegant? Is it nice? Is it, um, easy to wear and stuff like that? Pleasant, whatever you want to call it. Yes. Yes, it is. But, uh, I, it's not something that really makes me jump out of my seat and go, yes, go pay you know, hundreds for a 50 mil. It's not worth that. If you find a good deal, uh, like I did, go for it. But otherwise, I would probably say this is one that, 
you know, maybe you just kind of put on the back burner and if you ever find a bottle for a good deal, you snag it. Otherwise, I don't think you're really losing much anyways. If you have a bottle of, um, if you have a bottle of Boss Elements, you actually already kind of have a little bit of this DNA. Um, and to be quite honest, I don't really even have a preference. This DNA doesn't do very much for me. So I could wear one or the other and I'd be just as satisfied. But um, yeah, these are not going to make my top favorites or anything like that. But they're they're neat little collector pieces because they're both discontinued. Uh, cool little bottle though with the textured mountains. Um, and of course, everyone loves the damn bear. The Rockford bear. Okay, next on the list we have a fragrance from Atkinson's again. And this is my favorite Atkinson's. And this is the one that I would pay bigger money for. As it turns out, I actually got this cheaper. I got it from Le Parfumé before they really raised their prices, which they did. Uh, the prices at Le Parfumé have gone through the roof. It, I mean, just astronomical price improvements. Um, and so this is a fragrance that's called Duke. And so Duke is now, look at that guy. He looks like he's having the time of his life. So, um, Duke by Atkinson's is one of the, if you look it up in Parfumo, by the way, which I didn't look any of these up beforehand, so I'm kind of doing it on the fly as we are chatting. But Duke, uh, if you go to Fragrantica, you'll see a note listing. If you go to Parfumo, you won't see any note listing. Uh, Fragrantica says the note listing is Basil, Bergamot, Rosemary, Lavender, Anise, Artemisia, and Aldehydes, and then a heart of Spruce, Geranium, Tobacco, and Patchouli, with a base of oak moss, amber, leather, musk, and cedar. And so, um, interestingly enough, though, with that note listing, there is a fragrance that this really reminds me of. And the fragrance that this really reminds me of is a fragrance that came out a couple years before this. So I really think this is um, heavily inspired by that other fragrance. And the other fragrance is actually under lock and key. But I do have a mini, I think. Uh, maybe even the mini is put aside. Yeah, the mini is even put aside. Um, but uh, I've talked about it on the channel before. It's called Boss Spirit. So it's one of the three-headed monster of the early Boss releases. There were basically three that came out in the 80s for, for men from Hugo Boss. One is one of my favorite fragrances of all time, top 10. Uh, and that's um, Hugo Boss number one. And then um, Boss Spirit came out, or sorry, Boss uh, Sport came out after that. And then Boss Spirit came out in 89, I believe. So this came out in 1992. And this is heavily, heavily inspired by Boss Spirit. Or you could also put this in the same category as uh, a fragrance called Salvador by Salvador Dali, which I actually have the box right here because I picked up a little partial backup when I was in Houston recently. So there is the bottle. Salvador by Salvador Dali, and take a look at that, beautiful, um, I love the artwork, I love the design, back when they used to put some time and thought into their, um, into their presentations, and when all the bottles weren't uniform, look at this bottle, and I mean, even though there's only a little bit of juice in there, what a gift, this was a freebie, Oh, uh, man, I love this stuff. So th th actually these three, I think in my connections video, I may have put Boss Spirit, um, Salvador by Salvador Dali, and Duke by Atkinson's all into this connection. Uh, and that connections video is kind of a great way to see what I think kind of falls into similar categories. Duke is, I don't think I've ever shown this uh, this box on the channel before, but um, Duke is my favorite Atkinson's fragrance of all time, actually. It's so good, it's probably even backup bottle worthy. Fragrantica says it's aromatic and fresh, spicy, and woody, and it is all those things, but it has this, um, you know, the difference between Boss Spirit and, and Atkinson's Duke to me is Boss Spirit, 
when when you smell that green opening, it almost smells so green that you uh, s that you think you're smelling like all the green notes in the world combined. You know, even things like cannabis and these deep dark green notes, right? Uh, and this doesn't have that. Yes, it does open up kind of green and spicy, uh, but I think some of that lavender tones down and aldehydes. I think some of the aldehydes and the lavender maybe tones down some of that harsh greenness, if you will. And they've added a note of spruce. And spruce, I think, is one of the most underrated green, underused green notes in men's perfumery uh, or in perfumery in general. Um, and that leather note, while, you know, Boss Spirit basically transitions from extremely sharp green, beautiful, but very sharp green, to very dark 80s leather, which I love. This starts to go maybe even lean a little bit more into that DNA of, uh, which I, I just did an unboxing yesterday of, I, and I wore this to bed, and so I will publicly proclaim instantly, this is my favorite Chiruti, by far. It's called Fair Play. I wore it to bed. I absolutely loved every second. And if you um, watch, if you go to Parfumo and actually pull this up, you'll notice Keith's uh, Manly Senses review. And he says that this is like the uh, the grand or the father of YSL jazz. And I completely agree, except um, one of my commenters, GMG, left a comment, one of my subscribers, GMG, left a comment saying that he picks up a little bit of an anise accord in this. And I, and I agree, there is something slightly anise, but it's very... It's it's very deftly used, and it is also mixed to my nose with maybe something of a little bit of fruit, almost like um, the style that Jill Sanders would use this little raspberry note, you know, to blend everything together. But there's this classic 80s DNA that turned into YSL jazz that, you know, Zeno kind of got, I lump all of those kind of together, even though jazz and Zeno are maybe a little separated I always lump them together, and then you could say Zeno became, um, you know, something like then Guerlain Heritage, and then Escada Por Homme. And so the reason I went down that rabbit hole is that there is a little bit of this Guerlain Heritage DNA in this, and they both came out in the same year, 1992. And I'm always interested whenever I get connections to perfumes that came out in the same year, it's always interesting to me uh, whether the houses were really that much borrowing from each other or whether like the ingredients they were using from the oil houses at that time just kind of made everything smell somewhat similar, even if it's just slightly in the background. But imagine you took, you know, 80% Boss Spirit um, and just kind of blended it a little bit with that Guerlain Heritage, maybe even a slight bit of this uh, Chiruti Fair Play, maybe a slight bit of jazz, and this kind of musky lavender. Oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful. Backup bottle worthy, honestly. Um, and so, so happy to, to even have this, actually. It's one that's been on the list for a while. So that is Duke by Atkinson's. If you like the kind of things that I like as far as the late 80s and early 90s go, Duke is a must sniff. It is so, so good. Okay, so... That covers that House of Atkinson's, and we talked about a couple bonus fragrances here. Um, so next on the list, we have a Guerlain, speaking of Guerlain, and it is the aforementioned Heritage. So I've shown this fragrance on my channel a million times. I've professed my love for it, uh, my deep, true adoration for Heritage. I think it's one of the most brilliant masculine fragrances of all time. Uh, and if you said, Ramsey, you can make one masculine Guerlain, what would it be? It would probably be a toss-up between this and Abbey Rouge, and I think this would win. I would take Heritage. Gold Cap Heritage is, uh, a Titan. Uh, a AC from the channel Smells Good said that this is a colossus of a fragrance, and it is. It really is. It, um, it ties everything from the House of Guerlain together, all of the past fragrances, hold a spot in Heritage, hence the name Heritage, you can smell a little bit of Jiki in this. You can smell a little bit of Abbey Rouge. Uh, you can smell a little bit of Vetiver. You know, there's just, and this brilliant, 
Rockstar Patchouli, as uh, AC said that in his review, which is the most best review of this on YouTube, by the way. Um, and he said there's a Rockstar Patchouli, and he's spot on. The patchouli in this, with that earthy, you know, woody undertone, uh, it is just unbelievable, fantastic stuff. And I think that um, I think that this is the greatest uh, Guerlain masculine, in my opinion. I would put this number one, I would put Abbey Rouge number two, and I would probably put oh God, maybe Vetiver number three, and then probably Lidge, L'Instant de Guerlain, O Extreme number uh, four. But man, that's a tough one. But definitely, this is one, Abbey Rouge is two in my mind, but this, oh man. And then, of course, this inspired Roja to make his version of Heritage, which is Danger. And I, as you guys know, I love this DNA, so I do love Danger. But uh, for $500 for 50 mils, it, uh, it can be a tough sell. You know, that's the thing. Value for money is very low, but if you go into this completely blind and you have no clue... If you had no clue this existed, right, which you'd have to be a little bit of a fragrance buff, um, you know, I was, what, seven years old when this came out, and so you got to be a little bit of a fragrance buff to go back in history and understand how the fragrances all come together, right? But if you smelled this and you said, this is the greatest fragrance of all time, you know, this is, Roja Dove's a genius, I could forgive you for that if you did not know that this existed, you know? But knowing that this existed, it, it just comes across as a take. Uh, heavily, heavily inspired by Heritage. Some even say a clone. And, you know, you can't get away from that. You, you, if you've ever smelled Heritage, you will smell it in uh, danger. Um, but this is... Uh, and the bottle is supposed to be Fockholt's Pendulum. There's a story on that. You can check it out. Uh, it's just a brilliant piece of, masterpiece piece of work, and I'm, I'm very glad to have this, and I'm very glad to have a backup, I've got a backup of, um, of Heritage in the big 200, I think it's a 200 mil splash, so I'm set on, on Heritage, on vintage Heritage, but, uh, I've never got a chance to show the box on the channel before, and it's just very, very classy stuff, the vintage box, that's basically what it looks like. And you can see the uh, the short ingredient list. Okay, next on the list, let me put you back, Danger. I know you're jealous of Heritage's success. Okay, next on the list, we have a Victor and Rolf, another box I don't think I've ever shown. Actually, most of these I don't think I've ever shown on the channel. This is uh, Victor and Rolf's Antidote. So I do like this presentation. It almost looks like there's a wax seal on the box and it matches the bottle because whenever you open it up you will notice that the cap on the bottle actually has this wax seal like presentation beautiful stuff fantastic little piece of work uh, the only downside is the atomizer on mine broke it still sprays but you've got a kind of you know, you've got to kind of finagle it a little bit, but it does still spray the juice. But these atomizers are known to break. Multiple atomizers on multiple people's bottles have broken, but um, I am very happy to have the big boy bottle. And this is a complex fragrance that has, honestly, a little bit of everything, I think. If you are somebody who likes complex perfumes, if you're someone who is a compliment bro, you won't like it um, because Antidote can sometimes come across, it's a very complex fragrance and it can sometimes come across as it gives off different vibes in different weather. So whenever you smell it, you're going to smell something that at sometimes seems very fresh, sometimes spicy, sometimes woody, sometimes warm because there's this uh, cinnamon nutmeg combination. Um, sometimes sort of uh, resinous, woody, even leathery. Uh, there's this leathery patchouli, there's amber, there's iris. Sometimes you, you get this irisy posh type thing. So spicy, sometimes it's sweet, but just enough sweetness. Not this modern, you know, this is 2006. 
that we're talking about. So this is this very modern take on uh, sweetness, not this more recent, you know, everything is uber tonka bean sweet. No, this is more of this modern take on sweetness. And um, it's discontinued, unfortunately. And I say that uh, because I think that this is the best fragrance that Victor and Rolf as a house ever came out with, in my opinion. In my opinion, I think this is the best fragrance. Um, so it is discontinued. But uh, you can still find bottles, but they're going to be kind of pricey. And the, the topper for me, what tops it all off, is the Perfumer. Uh, this is a Pierre Wargnay. So Pierre Wargnay, uh, as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest perfumers of all time. He made Boss Number 1, uh, which instantly puts him as one of my favorite perfumers, because that's one of my favorite scents. He also made this, which if you like Boss Number 1... I would urge you to check out Tenade, and I don't think I've ever shown this box on the channel either. Uh, Tenade is a 80s fragrance as well, and you can see the work that Pierre Wargnay was doing in the mid-80s for Hugo Boss, Hugo Boss number one. You can see the DNA in this, in Paco Rabanne's Tenade. There's that animalic honey that you get. But what they've done here is they've amped up a lot of the florals. So this is kind of that late 80s floral heavy masculine fragrance um and so if you like things it's so good though if you like things like um you know Akitos by Alain Delon uh I would definitely urge you to try Tenere one of the one of my favorite masculine floral fragrances if you will um but yes Pierre Wargnay did this with another perfumer whose name is uh, Eleanor Massinet. Sorry if I butchered that. I think it's Al Eleanor, but uh, my Texas tongue is going to betray me. There's no need to even try to correct me because I'll never, I'll never learn. Uh, I will always be a pronunciation disappointment. But, um, but yes, Mr. Massinet or Massinet, uh, he. Um, he did this perfume with Pierre Wargnay. So, I mean, if you're someone that likes complex fragrances, this could easily have been a niche fragrance in today's world. Uh, and they could have charged, you know, the $300 that it's going for nowadays. Um, I'm just going to grab a sip of water, excuse me. Pardon me whilst I hydrate. So, yes, okay. Next on the list, we are moving on to a Lacoste fragrance. And this is the original Lacoste for men from 1985, I believe. You can see the short ingredient list right there. Every vintage head's dream, alcohol, water, fragrance, and menthol. Well, maybe not the menthol part, but everything else. Um, this box is so old that they actually did not have a um, a, uh, I was going to say URL code, but that's for a, uh, that is for the internet, um, UPC, UPC code, I guess. Uh, so they actually stuck, they, they taped or they, uh, glued one on. I don't know if you can see, but yes, it's, uh, it's like cut out and glued on there. Um, and if you buy this fragrance, I would urge you to try to buy the virgin that the virgin try to buy the version that says sofa par. Sofa par is the one that you want to buy. It actually came out. They were the distributor before Proctoring. I believe it's Proctoring Gamble that ended out that ended up uh, finishing this off. The original Lacoste, 1985. I thought it was 85. Is it 86? 87. Hmm. Lacoste. Lacoste. 1985. All right. I got to click on it now. Now it's just making me mad. Which one are you, Lacoste? Let's see. Nineteen eighty four. That's why I couldn't pull it up. It was, uh, 
It was 1984 it originally came out. And yeah, it was last marketed by Procter & Gamble. So yep, that 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 would do it. Um hang on one second. I'm going to I'm going to turn on the light. Don't go anywhere. Okay. So yes, this is um basically uh this is a green fresh uh, country club smell is what it smells like to me. It smells very, uh, posh, very 80s, you know, like if you were going to go play a game of golf, this is what I would wear. This is the golf fragrance. Uh, this is supposed to be kind of a sport version, a sport fragrance, if you will. And way back in the day when, when the Lacoste originally had fragrances, it was, uh, Jean Patou who actually made uh, their fragrances. So Jean Carlio made all of the Lacoste fragrance, the original Lacoste, which is a unicorn. I think Rich Mitch has a bottle. Um, I've never smelled it, but I hear really good things about it. That's a, a, a Jean Carlio fragrance. And so it's very good, very great, very green, basil, galbanum -y, you know, oak mossy, um, vetiver -y freshness, lavender, a lot of uh, green freshness in, in the original Lacoste. Okay. Next on the list is actually a fragrance from Calvin Klein, and it's my favorite Calvin Klein fragrance, and it is called Calvin. Now, you've seen this bottle on the shelf a lot. I don't think you've ever seen the box. So that is the Cologne box, 100 mil, and can you see the price? Ooh, that's a tough one. I'm pretty sure it says $15. Yep. I think that's 15 bucks. I think the .00 or 15.99 or whatever it is came off, but I'm pretty sure this is $15. How's that? I wonder how old this box is. I can tell you it's old because of the ingredient list though. SD alcohol 39C fragrance and Vasa, and that's it. Um, Calvin Klein Cosmetics Corp. Something every vintage fragrance enthusiast wants to see. And actually, I put this in the um, in the bag. Look at this little baggie that it came with. It almost looks like a sock, doesn't it? Um, weird little baggie that it came with. Very strange. Back in the day, they used to do stuff like this. It almost doesn't even fit. Look, I mean, you really got you to gotta work to get it in. And there she comes. All right, look at this. A beauty. Oh, signature scent worthy. Could easily be a signature scent. 1981, from the greatest fragrance year in history as far as I'm concerned. I mean, just having, forget all the other fragrances, just having Koros and Teus and Calvin by Calvin Klein from 1981 um, does it all. And this is according to Parfumo, by the way. So if Fragrantica or Base Note says something else, please don't come bite my head off and be like, no, you're wrong. It's 1980. You know, we'll just we'll just go with Parfumo since I stick with I stick with one usually. Okay, next on the list is one of the greatest masculines of all time. I recently did a ranked uh, Dior video, and this wound up number one, numero uno, and this is a 1980 release. The second greatest year, or maybe 1978 is the second greatest year, and 1980 is the third. We can debate that one day. But this is the great Jules. And it is apparently Jules, not Jules, not Jules, but Jules. Um, and look at me giving uh, elocution lessons. Okay, so this is uh, a splash. This is a splish. And I have another one coming, thank God. Uh, hopefully it'll be here in the next couple months. This is, um, God, man. This is a Jean Martel creation, who also created Paco Rabanne Porom, and then he just disappeared off the face of the earth. He just created, like, two of the greatest masculine fragrances uh, ever, of all time, and then he just, poof, disappeared. No more. Um... And I am just so impressed with his work, man. I mean, again, speaking of signature scent worthy fragrances, uh, I love this box too. I love the box and presentation. 
It's so 80s. If you um, if you actually go to Parfumo, you can see the uh, advertisement with the guy. He's got a black jacket on the back. It says Jules. He's like kind of looked the other way. I think Jules kind of means uh, pimp or it, it means something like that. Jules means means something along those lines, kind of like a pimp. Um, and there's also a couple other advertisements you can see. One of them is the name written out like this, but the letters are in red, and the J is is almost like the, this cool guy with his shirt unbuttoned, you know, hands in his pocket, and he's leaning against the J, you know. Uh, dressed to the nines, just, I love this stuff, man. It is, uh, it's everything that I want to wear in a vintage fragrance, and the more that I get to know this, the more times I spray it, the more time, the more I think 100% I did it justice putting it at the number one spot. This is the greatest Dior ever, as far as I'm concerned, um, for my taste. Again, I'm a leather fanatic, so you have to take that into account. Anything leather, especially in the 80s, I'm there. Uh, anything animalic, I'm there. A lot of things animalic, I'm there. Um, and this has that. It has, and it has that Jean Martel. You'll get little hints of kind of his DNA, his style from Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. It slightly comes through because this also has lavender. Um, and oak moss and tonka bean and ingredients you'll find in Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. But uh, this goes much more animalic and much leathery. And so for my taste, you know, and, and Paco Rabanne Pour Homme is one of the greatest masculines ever created. It's, it's very hard for me to say this, but for my taste, I would probably take Jules. Uh, this is more me. Paco Rabanne Pour Homme, that's my old man's signature scent. That's his forever, no matter how much I love it, no matter how much I wear it, it'll always be his. This is mine. Uh, so, so yes, that's my take on that. Okay. Next on the list is actually another Lacoste. I'm doing this out of order. Apologies. I was going to try to bunch them all together, but I see that did not happen. So uh, this is Land. This is Lacoste Land. Look at this box. So this came out in the early 90s, I believe. Uh, Lacoste Land. Lacoste Land. 1991 this came out. Again, discontinued again. Last marketed by Sofapar. Same last marketing as the uh, original Lacoste from 84 that I was telling you about. And this is actually, uh, I got this from Anuj, from the great Enchante Perfumes. The greatest little perfume house in the world, who is starting to get some recognition, I see. Um, I won't say any more, but uh, check this out. Look what they used to do back in the day. And shout out to Anuj for keeping this preserved. Look at this. Look at this. How cool is this, man? See what computers have destroyed for us? Now they're like, just go to our website. Bullshit. I want an insert. I want to, I want to be able to read it. Uh, even though that's in a language I can't read. I want to be able to read it. Uh, a fragrance which reflects a certain style. A certain sense of manhood. Ah, manhood. Back before, that was a bad word, by the way. A sense of manhood. Timeless. Not swept away by trends and fashion. Yet alert to the current and sensibilities of the age. An original fragrance. Striking a note of authentic character rather than standardized good taste. Suggestive, rather of the private enjoyment of the connoisseur, then the display of public acceptability. Land, harmonies of wood notes and spices, the freshness and vigor of hesper hesperides, the promise of fulfillment for lovers of distant horizons and the subtle perfumes of mountain and moorland, Woodland and green hillsides. Top note, a melody from the Garden of the Hesperides. Wow. Mandarin and grapefruit. Petit Grand. Lemon from Sicily. Guinea orange and neroli. Accompanied by essences of galbanum and French lavender. Middle note, 
the harmony of wood, sorry, the harmony of woody spicy notes with the intensity of bourbon vetiver echoing the rich extensions of oak moss and nutmeg, juniper, cumarin, and lavage, and the whole linked by the faintest hint of essence of rose. Roses. The bass, a symphony of amber and musk with notes of sage and benzoin, which underlined the heart of the composition. Damn, that just made me want to wear this shit. Um, it's been a while since I've worn land, actually. And my initial prognosis, the very first time that I smelled land, I thought, oh, how cool is this? It's got the individual number. Let's see if it matters. You know, I've never done this. I've never actually seen. It's my birthday. Let's, let's just have some fun. Let's screw around a bit, shall we? It doesn't want to get out of its packaging. And speaking of packaging, look at this. Tell me that doesn't just sing back. In 1991, to be fair, was not that long ago. Um, I mean, it, it is, uh, but it really isn't when you think about it. Would they ever put something like this? This would cost too much money today. They would never put something of this quality in there. And look at the, look at the flacon. Lovely. Look at the amount of plastic in this cap. Mm, it reminded it reminds me uh, of a sport version of uh, Eau de Hermes, or maybe like the original Burberry from 1980, 80 ish, give or take. I forget exactly when the original Burberries for men. And there's even maybe a little bit of quorum in here. Mm, you know, bourbon vetiver is one of my favorite vetivers. Um, Oak moss absolute, man. The good old days. I love the flacon too. Yes, it's plastic, but you know, it, uh, this is, I would consider this a sport. Just like I would, you know, Lacoste is a brand that I put into that sport category, and, and they really hit it out of the park here. Um, okay, go back to your home. Your new home. You haven't lived in your home in a while. So, Lacoste land. Very cool stuff. Okay, next on the list. Well, this isn't really a list, but next on the random groupings of bottles I pulled out. is going to be a creation by Alberto Morias. Ah, oh, we forgot to see if the numbers matched. Oh, well, I'll just have to trust it. I mean, this is pretty darn cool. I think it's cool. I think individually numbering something like that's pretty cool. All right, we'll just have to trust that it matches. So next on the list is going to be a fragrance from two all-star perfumers. One is uh, Rosen du Matu, and the other is Alberto Morias, and this is from the house of Puig, Antonio Puig, and this is called Sybaris. Now, Sybaris is often overlooked by many. Many people do not like this fragrance uh, because this has a little bit of the... Um, a little bit there's there's a slight whenever you first spray you'll get a little bit of this this original perry ellis for men from 1980 you have to get the one that says cologne for men if you get the re the reformulated version of this it's it's shite it's no good uh you have to get the one that says cologne for men and you will be a happy camper trust me this is a fantastic fragrance um perry ellis for men. Good stuff. Um, but there's a little bit of this uh, Sheepra cord, but I think what throws people off here 
is there's a big amount of cumin in the opening. Uh, Alberto Morias and Rosen du Matu did not screw around with that opening. It is big, bold, cumin, spicy, uh, and it's a kind of a weird opening because it opens a little green, a little aldehydic, a little cumin-y, and then it has that mossy shepra, you know, bed of mosses, right? And there's geranium, there's jasmine, juniper, artemisia, carnation, cinnamon, sandalwood. Uh, the advertisement, again, is just classic. Um, if you go check it out, uh, go to Parfumo, look at the advertisement, and 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 you'll you'll see it. It's good stuff. I love the old old school advertisements. And uh, this is worth a buy. If you can find it like I did, I paid 35 bucks for this 50 mil. At 35 bucks, it's a it's a buy. Probably even up to a hundred bucks, it's a buy. Over a hundred, I'd probably take a pass. But for a spicy sheeper like this from the 80s, it's good stuff. And you can you can really see Alberto Morias's like progression. This is 1988, and then a couple years later, he did I want to say Romeo Jiggly Per Uomo, uh, and you can just see his progression as a perfumer. And um, man, it's just it's just crazy that. Alberto Morias is the same Alberto Morias uh, that is pumping them out today. Hmm. Good stuff, though. I would highly recommend, if you're a lover of uh, vintage masculines, don't overlook Sybaris. Cool little packaging, too. I like it. The, the Sybaris on the bottom is gold. Okay. Next on the list, we have a famous 80s fragrance, and I had to decant this because I actually broke it. Um, well, the, the atomizer didn't work, so I, ha I had to kind of break it. This is Corum. So this is not a true vintage. Maybe I need to smell a deep vintage, but this is an older bottle, and you can kind of tell by the... Um, you can kind of tell by the um, copyright date, which shows 2003. So this is probably about a 20-year-old bottle, but it's not uh, the deep vintage because the original Corum came out in um, it came out in 1982. So I'd, I'd love to see what a true vintage looks like. But uh, there's your there's your packaging, crazy 80s packaging, right? One of the most 80s packaging you'll ever come across. Actually, one of the most 80s fragrances you'll ever come across. It, it smells like, you know, plaid couches and... Uh, it smells like plaid couches and jackets with elbow pads on them. You know, spicy, leathery, artemisia, cumin. It's that tobacco. It's that frankincense tobacco leather that always gets people and it's very green. That Artemisia in the top. I mean, look at the color of the bottle. And look at that clash with the cap, right? That gold, green, and, and maroon. Uh, it's actually a great color combination to uh, to give you an idea of what the fragrance smells like. So, so yes, one day I'll, I'll come across a deep vintage for a fair price. But... Uh, I'm I'm glad to have the juice that I have. It uh, it gets it gets it gets used. That's for sure. Okay, next on the list, we have a Molinard fragrance, and this is I think the version from the '80s. I'm not 100% sure, but this is called Abanita, the greatest Molinard fragrance of all time. Abanita de Molinard. This is the Eau de Toilette, which is now discontinued, uh, and this is a little 25 mil bottle that I was able to pick up for a song. You know, sometimes when something like that happens and falls in your lap, you just have to take advantage of it. And I did. And uh, this is, this is good stuff. This is probably, I think this is the best Molinard fragrance of all time. I don't think many people would even argue that fact. Um, but Abanita, let's see. Let's see what the, uh, what the Parfumo gods say. Habanita in Eau de Toilette came out in 1988. 
and it's now discontinued. They came out with the Eau de Parfum 11 years ago. I've never smelled the modern Eau de Parfum, but I hear it's still quite nice. But this is basically this, um, one of the best oriental, ambery, spicy fragrances. Rumor is that this used to be used to kind of, um, uh, flavor the cigarettes that women were smoking. So instead of spraying Abanita on themselves originally, they would actually spray their cigarette and whenever it would burn, it would give off this, this smell. Uh, because, you know, of course, classy women didn't smoke. And when they do, when they did back in the day, they wanted the smell of the smoke to kind of be hidden. They didn't want to smell like cigarettes, right? So that was what Habanita sold originally as, interestingly enough. Uh, and then, of course, it turned into a smash hit, and it became this symbol for women's uh, liberation, if you will, in the 20s. This came out 100 years ago, basically. And it opens up um, very uh, sticky. Sticky is a good word for this fragrance. It opens up very sticky and resinous uh, and uh, pudgy. Pudgy is also a pretty good word. Sticky and pudgy. Uh, doughy. Doughy is a good word for it as well. Uh, and you get a little bit of galbanum in the top, so it's kind of green with Petit Grand, but the uh, star of the show for this is a tobacco, and it's also a heliotrope note, and heliotrope adds this Play-Doh-like quality to it, right? And so you get rose centrifolia, vetiver, nutmeg, ylang lang, amber, musk, oak moss, patchouli, sandalwood, and vanilla, and that amber, vanilla, tobacco-y, there's no tobacco note listed in this one, but it's definitely there. I mean, there's this feeling of tobacco, right? Um, oh, it's so good. And don't let the fact that this is uh, a woman's fragrance throw you off one bit. I love wearing this stuff. And I probably should get a backup bottle. I, but I really, I would love to try a true deep vintage. Although it's very hard to find. Um, I'd love to try that one day. Okay, next on the list is going to be... A Serge Luton, a vintage Serge, uh, Palais Royale version of Serge, very hard to find. This is Musk's Kublai Khan, the, in the bell jar, um, 75 mil bell jars, Shiseido, this is probably also about 18, 20 years old, I would think, not 100% sure, but uh, this I got from... My good friend Mudasir. Thank you, Mudasir. And Musk Kublai Khan uh, is a challenging fragrance for me because I respect its beauty and I respect what it is and I respect the animalic nature of it. When I smell it, I get a lot of uh, synthetic civet and synthetic, um, like, feels like some, there's a little bit of white musk in there, but it's so well done. Um, but actually an ex used to wear this. So I have some weird, uh, um, there's, there's some weird feelings with Musk Kublai Khan for me. Sometimes I can appreciate it for what it is. Many times it's more of a museum piece that kind of just sits here and doesn't get worn very often. I need to force myself to wear it one day. Um, but it's just, we, you know. When you had an ex wear something, sometimes the, the memories are, are kind of strange, but um, that is Musk's Kublai Khan. And then, here's a box I know I've never shown before. This is Minotaur by uh, Paloma Picasso. And this is the Cosmere version. Actually, this one might have gotten shown when I, recently when I pulled it, when I pulled out all the boxes, this might have been one that ended up getting shown because I remember uh, mentioning the Cosmere version right here. Uh, and so Minotaur is a Michelle Almarac. That might have been when, too, when we did a Michelle Almarac video. Um, and I love the bottle. I love the Minotaur written across the bottle. Uh, and Minotaur is basically a fruity, um, it's a fruity summer. The way that I look at it is it's a summer fragrance for me uh, because I like how um, I like how the fruitiness mixes with the freshness, mixes with the um, this came out in 1992. And um, there's this 
how do you describe it? Almost like this resinous green galbanum, um, you know, floral, but with those fruits and, and fruits are a big part of this, the fruity opening with that aldehydic resins. And there are some throwbacks to the eighties masculines. You know, there's a little bit of tarragon, which I love, which can come off kind of anisic in quality. There's, um, uh, a floral heart with geranium, lily of the valley, jasmine, and rose. But really what makes this what it is, is that ambery, vanillic, tonka bean, woody kind of base. And it makes it very playful and very wearable, uh, especially in the heat. So you wouldn't think something with musks and vanilla and amber would be a summer fragrance, but for me it is. It has this, um, you know, similarity to apparently, uh, there was a, a Laura uh Biagiotti fragrance called Roma Uomo, not the original Uomo from 89, but Roma Uomo from 92 that smells very similar to this. And that was an Anique Minardo. So Anique Minardo and Michelle Almarac kind of go head to head with this DNA, two of the all time greats, right? Um, and so I ended up with this one because it's a Cosmere, but they both again came out in 1992 and they both smell very similar. So 1992 ended up being a very good year as well. Uh, okay, let me put this back and then we will move on to a box that probably no one has ever seen. This is because this is number one, this is a very rare fragrance. No one talks about it anyways. Uh, although I think it does deserve love. I don't think it'll ever get it just because of, you know, the situation. Uh, you know, it's just, it's not, it's never, I don't think going to be a hype beast, but this is from the house of Jay Casanova. And this is called J. Casanova Pour Homme from 1981. Again, a beautiful year. Look at this box. And I was, I was talking about this when I was talking about the fragrance. But look at that. Jeddah. So they were based in Saudi Arabia. And it's interesting because if you smell this, you could totally see this kind of being... This is before, you know, Spirit of Dubai and all of those Middle Eastern brands, you know, popped up. And um, if you smell this and and you just kind of imagine the Middle Eastern market in the 80s, what it was like, this could totally have been a smash hit in the Middle East, uh, I would think. And because it has this frankincense um, Middle Eastern feel to it. You know, it almost feels like something that uh, an Amouage would maybe try to put out in, in, in the 80s or something like that. It has a little bit of that floral, there's water lily in here, but there's also Osmanthus, which gives off this leathery, fruity-like feel. Osmanthus can be very peachy, very apricot-y, and um, some thyme in the top, and the thyme keeps it masculine along with the frankincense and sandalwood in the base. Um, and it's a beautiful green. Almost the, the frankincense here almost comes across as very green. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a hidden gem. Very few people talk about Jay Casanova. Poor Ohm. So again, special shout out to Anuj for finding that bad boy for me. I need to wear that soon. Okay, a couple more, and then we can, if you guys like this video type, I can do it again with uh, with some other boxes you guys haven't heard, seen yet. But uh, the last couple on the list, we've got uh, Anthracite. And no, not Tom Ford's Noir Anthracite, but Giacomo. Giacomo's Anthracite Pour Lome. This is the masculine version. Look at this. How's this for a little bit of a throwback? Short ingredient list. Um, and big, big box for not that big of a bottle because the bottle is strange. It's this. Anthracite Pour Long. There's a little bit missing in this, I think. Jonathan uh, and I were on a group chat with Rich Mitch, and he was talking about that the other day. Jonathan was saying that this is good, um, but it just feels like something, maybe it could have been great, Something a little bit's missing, and I agree with him. I agree 100%. I, I think that um, I think that they went for the um, maybe 
they they went for the pleasant, easier to wear side of things. They they needed to make this a little bit more, you know, this. And actually, to me, if I was going to wear this DNA, uh, just to give you some color. I could wear this. Or I could wear this. Borsalino. Uh, no, this is from the 80s. This is from 91. But they both kind of give off this, you know, spicy, woody, pleasant, but uh, you have to reapply every five or six hours feeling, right? Um, yeah, I, I've got a 200 mil of this, so I have no problem reapplying. But does it move you? Or are you going to get, you know, are you going to fall in love with anthracite pour l'homme? Probably not. No. Is it cool to have? Yeah, it's a cool little piece, but um, don't pay big money for this. Don't pay big money for this, you know. These are the two in this video I said don't pay big money for. Anthracite Pour Loam and, and Rockford. Okay, final two. So next on the list is Pierre Cardin's uh, Pour Monsieur, one of the greatest uh, EDT Pour Monsieur. One of the greatest fragrances ever created as far as I'm concerned. You can see the short ingredient list right there on the back. And you can see the sticker that was on the bottle that I, I taped on there. Um, just because I thought it was kind of cool. There's a lot of weird information on there. It says, Societe Nouvelle de Distribution de Parfums International. 74, uh, just, you know, weird stuff. Uh, but the... Uh, Note listing you can see is is short, so you can tell it's an older bottle, and it's, look at this, this is kind of cool, an old TJ Maxx sticker, $7.99 pennies, very cool, anyways, um, there she is, I just love this stuff, uh, I'm a huge, huge fan gigantic fan of uh, Pour Monsieur. I should probably have a backup bottle. This is all I have, but um, yeah, this is kind of the uh, place where the Amber Fougere began, right here. This is where it began. Pierre Cardin's Pour Monsieur. Pierre Cardin was uh, kind of in that space fashion race with uh, Paco Rabanne. Paco Rabanne and Pierre Cardin kind of both played in that same space. This is uh, Lavender uh, and it's uh, lemon, bergamot, orange, and basil with patchouli, sandalwood, iris, leather, carnation, and geranium. And then amber, benzoin, tonka, vanilla, leather, and moss. So it has that amber fougere DNA. Um, and, and this is like the, the first. So it's, uh, it's, one, it's, it's actually one of my favorite fragrances. My favorite Pierre Cardin for sure. Uh, and then finally, last one, since we're, we're passing the hour mark. Uh, I wanted to show you this because I think this is just cool stuff. This is, look at this. Look how clean this looks. This is Pantaccio 21 by Fede. Gianfranco Fede. Uh, I actually wore Fede for man just the other day from 1986. And I'll tell you what, that is a beautiful fragrance. But look how clean this box looks. I've never, I don't think I've shown this box before. Um... And this is the bottle that is the perpetrator. And you can see the short ingredient list here. But this is the one that's the perpetrator for having the... Ah, and look at this. I forgot about this. It has a little... It has a little... Um, a little... We have inspected it and everything is to our liking sticker. Or little insert by D, Diana De Silva Cosmetics in Flo Fiorenza in Milano. Interesting. Back in the day. Uh, well before Mask Milano. So this is the one that has the worst smelling Italian plastic cap of all time. This cap smells horrific. It smells like it was made in Chernobyl. It smells like it's going to give you cancer just, just breathing the air that it's in. Um, when I got this, I thought the bottle had turned. I was like, oh, sh that's terrible. And then you sprayed the fragrance. Fragrance is perfect. It's this It's this uh, plastic. Rich Mitch and I have talked about that. Uh, his, his is exactly the same. Some sort of weird Italian plastic that they use. 
But um, I think in the box, it looks damn cool. I love the kind of reflective lines and just a beautiful presentation. Pontaccio 21 is the, is the address of the headquarters of Gianfranco Ferre. Hey, from uh, back in the day, from, from back when this came out in 99 2000 whatever it was so so yes that is just a quick little um birthday video just a quick little well we're at an hour and i say just quick but just kind of show off some boxes we haven't talked about and talk shop on fragrances something i love doing on the channel uh which is the whole point of the channel obviously so i appreciate everyone watching i appreciate all the happy birthday wishes you guys are amazing thanks for being here with me uh, I love doing these videos with you guys. I love the conversations. I love uh, the learn the back and forth, the learning. Uh, you know the connections I've made. I have some outrageous birthday gifts coming for Mr. Ram. So in the next couple weeks, you're gonna see some outrageous unboxings. Uh, if you celebrate Easter, I hope you all have a happy Good Friday tomorrow and a uh, amazing Easter. Uh, with family and friends and thanks for watching and commenting and liking and all the amazing stuff that you guys do to help the YouTube algorithm We keep bringing more and more people to our little fragrance family our little fragrance uh, town if you will and uh, So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. I, uh, I, I, I love doing these videos and uh, And and I love that you guys are here with me. So thanks for being here. Cheers guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye